welcome. If you're watching this, perhaps you're someone who has a good plan for retirement. God has provided some resources, investment opportunities, maybe even an advisor or team to help plan for the future. And yet you don't always know where those investment dollars are going or what they might be financing. We choose the way we parent, lead, serve, and spend. What about how we invest and give? Our choices matter. And there's a growing movement of Christ followers who believe that our investments in philanthropy can go a long way in helping humanity flourish while also glorifying God. Faith-driven investing is no longer a novel idea. In fact, there are many people who've been doing it well for a while and whose stories you will have the opportunity to hear in this series. Our hope is that you can go through it with someone enjoy it on a walk or a drive, or even listen to most of it like you listen to your favorite podcasts. I'm Brooke, this is my husband, Luke, and we'll be your hosts during this series. We live in Nashville, we have kids in college and high school, we're business owners, investors, and much like you, our lives are busy with juggling careers, parenting, and trying to follow God's lead in all of it. As our family has grown over the years, as we've moved and traveled around the world, as we've been entrusted with more and more responsibility, we've experienced just how challenging it can be. We try to be intentional about being a couple on mission, to be good parents, and to be involved where we live and work. And still, like most couples out there, money is a common topic of discussion. How can we provide for our family without falling into a world of greed? How can we be joyfully and intentionally generous? How can we look at our hard-earned dollars, truly believing that it is not ours anyway, that God is the goal, not a certain standard of living? For a long time, Brooke and I thought about our money in very distinct buckets. We had a save bucket, which is my natural instinct, so I always think about that one first. Then we had a spend bucket, we had a give bucket, and then there was this other bucket which intersected with our savings that could be broadly described as our investing bucket. The Faith Driven Investing Framework has changed that structure a bit and changed how we save, spend, give, and invest. This series is about understanding the complicated relationship that so many of us have with money. We all want to be generous and glorify God, but I would say that we also want to be generous in places where our money can be multiplied. We are called to be good stewards of the full 100% He gives us. He owns it all, not just our tithe. Companies like Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A have proven that they can generate profits while also being Christ-centered. We as individuals are no different. We can make profitable financial decisions while simultaneously making an impact for God. In Romans 8, 6, Paul says that the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. If I'm to be so bold as to replace the word mind with the word finances, it would say, our finances governed by the flesh is death, but our finances governed by the spirit is life and peace. So what does it look like for our finances, all of them, to be governed by the Spirit? We looked it up, and there are more than 2,300 verses concerning money in the Bible. That's almost twice as many that mention faith and prayer combined. Jesus had a lot to say about money. Nearly 15% of the red letters in Scripture are related to money and possessions. So it seems to be something that we should pay attention to. This doesn't mean that Jesus cared about this topic more than our hearts, but he did realize that it was a dangerous hindrance to him being able to dwell within our hearts. If we're going to get this right, we need to take a serious look at our relationship with money and with God. Our friend, Andy Crouch, helps us to do that in this teaching. Let's see what Andy has to share on this topic. I want to talk about two mysteries uh, relating to Jesus' most famous words of, about money. And of course, you know what they are. You cannot serve God and most modern translations will say money. So the first mystery is why not? Why couldn't you serve God and money each in their appropriate way? The way Jesus said you could, God and Caesar. So Caesar's the pagan emperor of the Roman Empire. People press Jesus on the question of uh, whether they should even pay taxes to Caesar. And he says, well... Render to Caesar what's Caesar's, and render to God what's God's. So serve Caesar in appropriate ways. Don't serve Caesar the way you serve God. Don't treat Caesar like a God. But you can serve Caesar in his appropriate way and serve God. Why does Jesus never say you cannot serve God and Caesar, but he does say you cannot serve God and money? And then what exactly does Jesus say? Uh, because older translations have Jesus saying you cannot serve God and mammon, what is that word doing there? And uh, what would it mean that Jesus said you cannot serve God, not just and money, but God and mammon? 
So um, first question first, why, why is money more powerful than Caesar? I want to suggest it's because money, especially in large quantities, gives you a power that Caesar does not have. What is money? You learned it in economics. It's a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. And this means that money is fungible, countable, storable power. Power. The ability to get things done in the world, the ability to get what you want in the world, the ability to get that and get things done, perhaps even without other people wanting that to get done. That's power. And money gives you a form of power that's fungible, countable, and storable. So fungible. It can be exchanged for other things. So this uh, this obviously is, is one of the key things about money. It's actually of very little use all by itself, but you can turn it into whatever you want. Not true of most forms of power, including Caesar's. Caesar has a great deal of power as the Lord of the Roman Empire, but he can only exercise his power in that office, in that land. He's not the emperor of China. He can't just arbitrarily decide he wants something totally different or wants to exercise his power in somewhere totally different. His power has to be used in a particular context because most power is contextual. But money allows you to use power wherever you want, anywhere that legal tender is accepted. You can exchange it into anything. That's power that Caesar doesn't know, at least doesn't know because of his role as emperor. Uh, then it's accountable. You know how much you have of it. And this is definitely not true of most kinds of power. Uh, how much power exactly does the CEO of a company have? Well, certainly some. But if you've ever been in that role, you know it's hard to know exactly how much you have. There's certainly no way to count it. But you can measure money. You can count money. You can know how much is on your balance sheet, how much is available to spend. And you can't really do that with power. There's an uncertainty to other kinds of power, but not with the kind of power that we call money. And maybe most powerfully, you can store it. It's storable, a store of value. You can save it for later. And most kinds of power have to be exercised now, uh, at the moment that you have it, because you may not have it later, or it may not be given except in a given moment. I'm, uh, I have a certain amount of power as a speaker at FDI. I've got this moment. I've got the power to speak to you right now, but I can't save it for next month or next year. I've got to use it now. But if I have money, at a time of my choosing, I imagine at least, I can use it. And all of these kinds of power are a kind that Caesar doesn't have. And all of them add up to a power that is not dependent. There is no dependence in the power of money in the way that there is in most other forms of power, even political and military power. Caesar only had his role because he was the adopted or sometimes biological son of a powerful man. It was relationship that gave him power. Even in our modern democracies, people get power through the consent of the governed. But if you have enough money, the honest truth is you can get whatever done you want without anyone really having to know or care or even validate who you are. Because money talks without you having to be a person. It's impersonal power. This is a power greater than any other in the world. And if you have it or had it or can imagine having it, why would you need God? Who needs God? When you can get what you want, whatever you want, when you want it, when you know how much you have, you can store it and you don't have to be any particular kind of person to get what you want. Who would need God when you had money? So this is the first reason you can't serve it because this is a, the most direct rival to God in human affairs. And the reason people come to you and the reason you and I live with anxieties about money, with hopes for money, is because of the kind of power we imagine it will give us. But there's also a deeper thing going on, and it gets to the word that Jesus used. Jesus was speaking Aramaic, uh, the way he probably did his whole life. Uh, his biographers, the gospel writers, translate his words into Greek, and then we translate, in case of English speakers, into English so that we can understand. Uh, but every once in a while, the gospels will leave an Aramaic word untranslated, and they do so in this case. Uh, they write down in Greek, you, shall not, you cannot serve God, and they just leave it untranslated, mammon. It's a Semitic word that roughly means money or assets held in trust or that create trust. Why, is, why do they not translate this word? Well, what kinds of words do we not translate? The most common kind of word we don't translate are names. You don't translate a name 
from one language to another. You just transliterate that name. And that's what the gospel writers do here. And the early church concluded that the reason they did this is they understand they, they understood something that Jesus was saying, which is that we're not talking about a, an ordinary noun here. We're not talking about even just a principle or an idea. We're talking about a quasi-personal, nameable power in human affairs that intends something, that has a will in the world that is opposed to the will of God. And the ordinary way we talk about this, ordinary, extraordinary way, is we're talking about a demonic power. The early church concluded that mammon was not just an idea or a principle, but the name of a being in service of the enemy of all that is good, the opponent of all of God's works in the world that we sometimes call Satan or the devil, that mammon is this demonic force at work in history with a kind of quasi-personal ability to whisper and speak to human beings and to arrange and distort human affairs in a particular direction. And what is it that mammon wants to get done in the world? What it wants the opposite of what God wants. God has made this good, beautiful, abundant material world. He fills it with persons. He says, this world is already very good, but now I want you to uh, fill the earth, multiply, and bring forth all the possibility and all the value out of the world. As the world is filled with persons, it will become full of the knowledge and love of God and the knowledge and love of one another, and in, in some ways, the knowledge and love of the world itself. Well, mammon, being aligned with the demonic, being part of the demonic forces at work in history, hates all of these things. Of course, it hates God. It wants us never to depend on God. Mammon hates creation itself, doesn't like the material world, wants an immaterial world that's purely spirit. And think about how money functions as it, as, as it gets more advanced. It becomes less and less physical. We don't carry around gold anymore. We just account in our minds the imagination of how much we have. And mammon hates persons. It wants you to operate impersonally. It actually wants to turn persons into things. In fact, when mammon really gets its grip into a human society, as it had gotten its grip into the Roman Empire, as it got its grip into the, the capitalism that built our Western world, the result is treating persons like things. Treating persons impersonally. This is what slavery is. It's treating a person like property. It's treating a person like a thing. And while God wants the world to be filled with persons so that the whole world will be known and loved and God will be known and loved in everything, mammon wants to empty the world of persons. Mammon wants everything to be impersonal so that there's no one and nothing, no one left, only things and ultimately not even material things. Just an immaterial world that is devoted to pure power without dependence. You cannot serve a demon that wants to destroy persons, relationships, creation itself, and also serve the true God who wants to reunite persons, restore relationships, and liberate creation from its bondage to decay. You cannot serve God and mammon. And this demonic power called mammon bestrides our world, our modern world, in an absolutely unique way in history. The, how can you doubt? This is the principle that is driving human events in a way that wasn't even true in Jesus' day, wasn't even true a thousand years ago, but is incredibly true today. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so I've started to think that <laughs> what's faith-driven investing? <laughs> I mean, investing is about the deployment of many kinds of resources, but especially financial ones, especially in our modern world, money-based uh, resources. Is our job just to sort of do that with Christian principles, kind of... Uh, you know, obviously not violate Christian principles, but just do things with money in the world uh, and maybe make money uh, in Christian ways in the world. I, th I think that is not nearly deep enough for what we're actually called to do. We are actually here insofar as we are people who operate proximate to money and the whisperings and power of mammon to take back territory from this demonic power and from these false promises of fungible, storable, countable power and reclaim territory for the relational, creation-loving God uh, who has placed us here to tend his world. 
So if we're going to do that, we're going to need to do two kinds of things. We're going to need to have some detox moves and some creative moves um, or creative resistance, let's say, to the Empire of Mammon. The first thing we're going to have to do is just thoroughly dethrone Mammon and this imagination of money as power without relationship, abundance without dependence. We're going to have to dethrone that from our lives. Um, so just two quick detox ideas um, that I think all of us need to take super seriously. <laughs> Um, the, the basic way to dethrone money and mammon is generosity. It's giving because most ways we use money, uh, give us control and safety, but giving releases control by definition. When you give, you no longer have control. Giving is risky. Uh, by definition, when you give, you're, you're giving up some store of value you could have held on for some other use. And you're just saying, you're just saying, I release it. It's, it is the basic detox activity. The Christian church has often taught a kind of principle of tithing on income, and I think that's a really good thing, though I think many of us should probably aim for a higher percentage than 10. Um, I just want to say what, what has been absolutely transforming for my own life and our family in the last 10 years is twice now we have felt God leading us to tithe not on our income, which we continue to do in a graduated way, um, but to tithe on our assets. So we calculate our net worth, all the things that are entrusted to us that we know how to value. And we uh, find a way to liquidate 10% of that and give it away to the purposes of God and his kingdom uh, and the good of our neighbors. Um, I will tell you, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried this. Uh, if you try it uh, first, <laughs> it is incredibly hard to pull the trigger in that way. It feels really risky in a way that tithing on your income doesn't because you kind of know that income's coming in. But this store of assets I have, I mean, this is my store for the future. This is my promise of security for the future, of options for the future. And 10% is enough to hurt, at least for us. And once you do it, the joy and freedom you feel with relation to money is just unbelievable. It, it has been the thing that has just truly emptied me, especially having done it twice now in the last 10 years, just emptied me of, of the fear and love of money as near as I can tell in my life. It's just gone. It's just not part of my anxieties. Uh, and instead I'm joyfully anticipating the next time I get to give away, um, this level, uh, at this level in, in my life. The second detox move. So generosity is the first, the second would be, um, something I'm not really going to model here so directly. Um, but it's transparency. If we were together in person, and I do this with many, many groups, some of you have been part of it, and I do it with many individuals, um, rather than just talking about our family's generosity in uh, percentage terms, I would put up graphs and tables that have numbers on them. They show you how much we make in a given year, our family, our household, how much we have been entrusted with, our net worth, how that's changed over time, how we've given, how we've spent, how we've saved, all with real numbers. And when I do that consistently, People say, I have never, ever heard a fellow Christian outside of some kind of confidential fiduciary relationship tell me how much they have and how much they make. Brothers, sisters, this should not be so. This secrecy that we have around these numbers that are, are the most immaterial thing about our lives is a sign that mammon has its grip on us. And a very powerful way to detox is to open up your books, uh, not in a willy-nilly way, and I don't do it when it's virtual and online because it's, it's severed from relationship right now. But in any kind of relationship, I'm happy to share uh, the complexities of what, what God has entrusted to our family and how we're trying to be faithful with it. Why is this not normal in the Christian community? Because we are trying to serve God and money. We're trying to serve God and mammon at the same time. If we detox, if we are so lavishly generous, if we're so openly transparent, um, what will we be free to do? What will become possible for us? Two strategies of creative resistance to mammon. The first is we will be able in every transaction, every investment, every business decision to prioritize not money, but people. To prioritize people, relationship with people, connection with people. The primary question we will ask about every deployment of our assets, including our spending, as well as our saving and our investing and our giving, 
is what will this do to strengthen relationship, to create capacity of love and dignity and respect for other people so that we can all do in the world what we were made to do? Only those who are free of mammon can realize that every transaction is actually an opportunity for love to grow, for love to be expressed in the world. And a secondary byproduct is whatever accounting we may make of the value that we can trust will be created as we operate in a loving and people prioritizing way, person prioritizing way in the world. And then the second strategy of creative re uh, resistance to mammon is that we can learn to be just ridiculously patient, <laughs> ridiculously patient, uh, ridiculous that is to mammon because mammon is in a hurry. Mammon wants you to make more of that money fast. Mammon wants you to move so fast you don't notice the people you're running over to make it. And we learn from our Lord Jesus and we learn from God's own way with his creation that there's this incredible divine patience that's available to us. We are not in a hurry. So we will think less and less about IRR, more and more about what you know some people call MOI, multiples on investment. God is in the world. God wants us to be in the world to create multiples on investment for sure. But IRR, timing, how fast, the velocity of money, that's ultimately up to God. That's not the most important, th not the most important thing. And this will lead us to have a thousand generation vision for our lives. <laughs> if you give yourselves over to mammon, give yourself over to mammon, and you act in all the exploitive ways that mammon would have you act in order to get more of that countable, storable, fungible power, you will do a lot of damage, but we know exactly, or we know, uh, according to God, how long that damage will last. God says, if you enter into that kind of iniquity and mammon leads us to iniquity, it will do damage unto the third and fourth generation. This is Deuteronomy 5.9. But the interesting thing is, even if you operate very ethically in the way that we're taught to in modern investment and business, the truth is that the results, financial and otherwise, of, of even our best investments, even our best enterprise building, also probably will last about three or four generations. Honestly, most family wealth is kind of exhausted after three or four generations, diluted. Most businesses don't last more than that. Most of the work you and I do in, a, in our daily work, let alone the financial investments we place, I mean, realistically, it's, it's only going to last three or four generations. But God says to those who love me and keep my commands and walk in my way, I visit blessing to the thousandth generation. That is not going to be measured primarily in any kind of financial return, that is measured in the flourishing of persons, in the transmission of love, in the creation of redemptive possibility in the world. And it's only available when we are completely serving God. We've completely detoxed from serving money. Any use of money is simply to serve this God on, on whom we are completely dependent. Can we do that? Can we live in this world that mammon rules in a totally different way? Can we totally dethrone its power from our lives so that all of our work as investors and spenders and savers and givers is devoted to God and God's ways, prioritizing people, pursuing patience? It's as easy as a camel going through the eye of a needle, right? With human beings, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I loved Andy's two charges, detox and creative resistance. Detox by finding ways we can rid our heart and mind of the unhealthy and uninspired ways we've grown up thinking about money. And creative resistance to think about the intentional ways we can actively invest and give contrary to the status quo. For Brooke and I, that looked like establishing a financial finish line for our family. This meant that we determined just how much our family could live on comfortably. Some of our best friends had been working through the answer to the question, how much is enough? And we made that answer known to others, business partners and friends who can help hold us accountable. Doing so has helped us recognize when want, entitlement, and an ever-growing desire for more starts to creep in. Frameworks and finish lines give us some practical ways to recalibrate as we go through life. In this series, we're also gonna see what it looks like to move from reshaping our heart posture to taking action.
There are now great fund managers with track records and written spiritual integration plans across virtually every asset class and geography. There are opportunities to invest where outcome and impact are the important drivers, but there are also dozens of funds that are on the market return side of the spectrum as the investing world is coming to understand that investments might succeed not at the expense of biblical values, but because of them. What's something new you learned today? Are you serving more than one master? In other words, are you in that awkward in-between where you want to follow God's lead, but you're not ready, or you don't know how to fully let go? What detox and creative resistance moves do you need to make? Pray about this with your spouse. Invite a friend to pray for and with you. God seems to be most present when you can share your thoughts and dreams with the people you trust most. Write your prayers down in a journal for something to look back on and to see God moving in your life. See you next time. Faith Driven Investor is a discipleship ministry from Faith Driven Movements, a nonprofit corporation whose mission is to inspire and mobilize people to use their time, talent, and resources to impact the world around them. The materials are for informational purposes only. All investing carries risk, so be sure to consult an advisor before making any investment decisions. Hosts and guests may maintain positions in the companies and securities discussed. For all other questions, please visit faithdriveninvestor.org. Thank you.